So thank you. Um, now let me introduce the first reader tonight, um, and then uh, Emma will introduce the second. An esteemed professor of English literature at Colgate University, Philip Richards has a rich publishing history, including Blackheart, The Moral Life of Recent African American Letters, an insightful and provocative exploration of critical contemporary issues. He's co-authored a work entitled The Best Literature by and About Blacks, as well as numerous articles and essays in such varied journals as Harper's, The American Scholar, and the Massachusetts Review. His most recently published work is his autobiographical An Integrated Boyhood, Coming of Age in White Cleveland. In it, he explores how his parents move into what we may now call, if we watch television, that is, suburgatory, left him confused and dislocated at the very moment of his parents' upward or outward movement. As its publisher, the Kent State University Press, describes it, his narrative of success provides the background to a more private turmoil. Richard's struggle to read the shifting meanings of his privileged experience amid the city's shifting racial lines, the fringe on the left, the tumult of rising black consciousness, and the fears of nervous white suburban neighbors. This coming of age story sings the undersong of an older generation's hard won success. Like all black Clevelanders, Richards was forced to struggle for his understanding of the city's and his own endless racial confusion in the midst of frightening historical change. It is this reality that recurs throughout Richards' memoir, the early encounters of a scared, bookish African-American boy from Mount Pleasant with what can only be described as the real world. Um, in addition to welcoming uh, Philip here, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to see his uh, accomplished son Jonah here as well. So glad to see you both and uh, please join me in welcoming Colgate's own Philip Richards. Thanks a lot for that very generous um, introduction, uh, Matt. Um, I um, I struggled um, to um, find a um, introduction to this presentation that would um, frame it um, appropriately, and um, I um, I I came to um, rest on what um, actually drove me to write, um, to write outside of the academic world. Um, when I began this kind of writing in the late 80s and early 90s, I had to confront the reality that I would have to write about, in those famous words, uh, what I knew most. I had spent most of my adolescent and adult academic life in rooms, auditoriums, buildings, and institutions like this. And the experience that I had to relate was necessarily linked not to this world's commonplaces, but to the oddities, painful embarrassments, discomforting moments, awkward paradoxes, and sheer terrors of what my fellows unthinkingly took for granted. It is, of course, entirely possible to over-dramatize this rhetorical situation, which after all grounds so much first-person American writing the me myself who conceives of his identity as another is, most of us would agree, the favorite, perhaps the signature American narrative and poetic persona. And I don't want to compare the otherness of an integrated boyhood to the authentic strangeness of Emerson's nature or Whitman's sleeper. Um, the bar for um, multicultural difference was already set pretty high in the 1850s. Rather than emphasize difference, 
um, to use that ugly politically correct term. I would like to illustrate rather than define my posture uh, with the opening of Henry Thoreau's introduction to um, Walden. Um, I can't do better than um, this than um, to describe um, um, what I found was to be my plight. Um, I should not obtrude my affairs so much on the notice of my readers if very particular inquiries had not been made by my townsmen concerning my mode of life, which some would call impertinent, though they do not appear to me at all impertinent, but considering the circumstances very natural and pertinent. Some have asked what I got to eat. If I did not feel lonesome, if I was not afraid, and the like. I will therefore ask those of my readers who feel no particular interest in me to pardon me if I undertake to answer some of those questions in this book. In most books, the I or first person is omitted. In this it will be retained. That in respect to egotism is the main difference. We commonly do not remember that it is, after all, always the first person that is speaking. Moreover, I, on my side, require of every writer, first or last, a simple and sincere account of his own life, and not merely what he has heard of other men's lives, uh, some such account as he would send to his kindred from a distant land. For if he has lived sincerely, it must have been in a distant land to me. Um, I'd like to um, start my uh, book about uh, growing up in Cleveland, really in the um, 1950s, uh, 1958, 59. Um, the, um, we lived in uh, Mount Pleasant, which is the southeast side of Cleveland. And um, the uh, population was um, shifting from a uh, European and um, um, uh, Slovak um, population to um, a black population. Um, and um, this uh, shift would be repeated over and over again in the um, history of um, Cleveland during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And when I started doing research for this book, I was amazed to find that there were already social histories about this. My classes were in the mid-50s racially integrated by the remaining Eastern European and German children who had not moved to Cleveland's west side or southwest suburbs. The Jews, on the other hand, had moved to Shaker Heights and Cleveland Heights. My perception of white people was that they were all moving to the eastern suburbs from Cleveland. The darkening of the school's population apparently bothered my mother too. Deeply concerned about the education of her oldest child, my mother met with my principal, Mrs. Lord, at least every two weeks to check on my progress. Everything about my daily pro experience with my best friend seemed to shout that my family and its values could not be taken seriously. These values had, I noticed, not made me more generous or polite than my friends. Uh, spending recess on the playground, walking home for lunch or playing games during gym, I was as noisy, conniving, and wayward as anyone else. In fact, my parents' values seemed to make me more of an outsider. Despite my parents' inattention, my, seems, my friends, moreover, seemed to thrive in ways that I did not. By the time we reached the second or third grade, I envied my peers their athletic grace the casual ease with which they shot marbles, swept up a handful of jacks, or ascended in the air toward the basketball hoop as if drawn from the shoulders, their feet casually dangling. In races, their slender bodies, even those of the girls in dresses, shot by me with ease. They could hit a baseball to the opposite side of the outfield or throw a football in, it seemed to me, the manner of the pros, high in the air, spinning as if traveling along a cord, and finally dropping to a designated spot 30 or 40 yards away. 
I competed academically to achieve credibility in the classroom that I would never win out on the street. With more energy than finesse, I worked my way up to the most advanced groups in arithmetic and reading, always a little piqued that my friends seemed to excel so effortlessly. My urge to succeed led me to become as obsessed as my mother over major work, Cleveland's um, advanced pro program for advanced students. A daydreaming reader forbidden to enter the streets, I strove to become gifted. I did not score high enough on the IQ test to be admitted in the second grade and succeeded to my classmates' bewilderment only in the fourth grade. A number of my Robert Fulton classmates would enter this program in seventh grade, but none of my friends were contending for entrance early in elementary school. From second to third grade, my concern was a joke among my friends who teased me, nicknaming me Major Work. If a, person, if a person could be such an entity, then I was. Um, my initial failure to enter the program frustrated me. Thoroughly confused, I finally turned to my all-purpose source of information, the Childcraft Encyclopedia, the final volumes of which included information on child rearing. I did not understand many of the books that I tried to read as a child, but focused on the pressing question here of my intelligence. I grasped enough of what the Childcraft volume had to say about gifted children to be scared out of my wits. For once I read an adult text with enough care and critical reflection to understand it, and I received the shock of my life. I had believed the weak, slender, bespectacled figure such as myself to be the prototypical gifted child. Yet the clumsy, daydreaming person I had become was the encyclopedia insisted, not the prototype of the gifted young person. To the contrary, the gifted child was often physically well-developed, adept in his or her social relations with others, and emotionally stable often more so than his or her fellows. Indeed, intellectual gifts were simply one more sign of advanced childhood development. Carl, Martha, and Stephen were far more likely candidates for giftedness than I. Such well-adjusted people did not have to pursue it an advanced academic program. It would pursue them. Whatever I was, I fit into no standard mold for superiority. I came to understand that I was not a gifted person, but a smart aleck pretender, an academic hustler of sorts. Gifted people dominate the world around them, and my friends were mastering the worlds of sports, play, school friendships, and even extracurricular activities such as plays in which I did not participate. It was impossible for me to imagine myself being elected a class president, vice president, president or secretary like Carla or Martha, yet according to the Childcraft articles on gifted children, this was the kind of mastery that the truly intelligent young person possessed. This made me angry. For the first time it occurred to me that I, not the rest of the world, was marginal. I gathered that on our block on 137th Street in Mount Pleasant, my parents were considered odd. The postman walking down the street on Saturday morning winked at me. I suspect that their perception of their oddness led to conflicts that I did not understand. At the corner of 137th and Abel was a modernist house designed, built, and owned by a black architect. No one, not even my parents, could deny that they represented the highest level of black achievement. His daughter, Alita, a dark, attractive girl was in my class at Fulton. Her parents, successful, urbane people, had obvious contempt for mine. She was arrogant and intolerant, as full of her parents' self-importance as I was of my mother's claims to cultural superiority, and I disliked her immensely. By the third grade, we seemed always to be fighting over something that I could never define. She was snubbing me although I was too inept and distracted to know how she was doing it. For some reason, the erect, self-assured way she walked made me mad. 
At some point in the second or third grade, I made friends with Mike, the son of a ne'er-do-well black World War II veteran who could not support his swarm of children and meek Japanese wife. Mike did what he pleased. I often saw him urinating in the empty field at the northern end of our block as I walked home from school or sticking a detached extended television antenna into tomatoes and pears or stealing a Snickers candy bar or a large bag of M&Ms at the Fisher's supermarket on 140th and Kinsman. His father, Mike once told me, was in policy. Seeing my uncomprehending look, he stared at me closely and instructed me to tell no one what he had said. What, I asked my mother as soon as I got home, was policy. Did Mike mean that his father sold insurance? M my mother's answer stopped me cold. Mike's father was a runner. He handled the bets of people who gambled daily in the illegal numbers game. Mob bosses ran those games, ruthlessly enforcing bad debts with shootings and beatings. My parents often discussed this activity when the Cleveland press reported the arrest of these hoodlums. Thugs policed the actual games themselves. They in turn were defended by the Sharpie black lawyers who conducted their practices in the city. Who, she asked, did I think I was? Mike knew the streets and had sized me up. Did I think I could live by my wits out in Mount Pleasant? Unable to fight, ignorant of the realities of Kinsman and 140th, I was a mark. Mike would eventually take, she continued, whatever he wanted from me. I couldn't imagine anything I had that he would want, and beat me up. I was immediately afraid not only of him, I expected him to be coming after me soon enough, but of anyone else like him, now frightened, I began to heed the newcomers from the inner city at Robert Fulton. I was, I gradually realized, a moving target. The tough kids around me were not slow to notice this. During my last year at Robert Fulton, a small boy dressed in ragged woolen shirts and jeans began to follow me, punching and tripping me whenever we were alone. He waited for me at the close of school and every afternoon gave me a worse beating. He was perfectly silent, but from his intense, constant observation of my movements, I surmised he was e angry. I had abused him, had violated some code, just how I did not know. Perhaps he did not like the way I walked. Fighting was forbidden in my family, but this seemed to me a special case. I told my mother about the problem and she determined that my father should pick me up the next day. She interpreted this situation in an abstractly formal way, the legalism of which shocked me. My fighting was dangerous, I might be hurt, but in the unlikely event that I might hurt my attacker, even in self-defense, our family's property, she argued, might be at stake. My parents, she informed me, were property owners and therefore vulnerable to a costly insurance claim by my attacker's parents or even costlier legal suit. I found her logic chilling. I had not thought that our house was at stake out on the playground and that my parents could not protect me there. Uh, there's this wonderful essay in which Philip Roth um, describes um, Mr. Slammer in uh, Bellow's book as um, the super ego's uh, man in Manhattan. And um, that's a good description of my mother. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, the next day, uh, my father picked me up. It was a good thing, for I just made it to the car before my attacker could overtake me. Shocked, my would-be assailant turned on his heel, escaping down Abel. I was amazed at how fast he covered ground and he was well beyond 135th Street before my father and I caught up to him in the car. From there he dipped and bobbed through Mount Pleasant's back streets and alleys toward Woodland Hills. A few times we came upon other boys who looked much like him, and it occurred to me that Mike would necessarily know the streets well. I had never looked hard at Mike's face, 
and for some reason I began to think that my attacker might be Mike. As I looked out the window at the boys going home, I grew increasingly excited. Indeed, Mike seemed to be everywhere. As we chased my attacker, I realized how many boys his age there were in Mount Pleasant. He was a creature of the streets in a way that I would never be, even if I were to live there my entire life. He had obviously hidden before like this, perhaps from shopkeepers or the police. His disappearance, preceded by the initial flurry of escape, was as deft and mysterious as the magician's tricks I had seen at the 140th and Kinsman branch of the Cleveland Public Library Party for children who had read and reported on 10 books the previous summer. In response to my query, the performer averred that magicians never tell the secrets of their tricks. By the time we got to Woodland Hills Park, I conceded that my assailant had vanished leaving only my fear. Silent and tight-lipped, my father drove me back home. He had lost some hours of overtime and was not pleased. I was dumbfounded. I was afraid of the city, its Negroes, and its streets as my parents were. I understood why they kept me at home. I did not now particularly care to leave the house. After this incident, my father paid special attention to me during our Saturday chores keeping me by his side as we worked. On those mornings, I watched as he puttered about the garage in search of tools with which to change the car's oil, set the spark plugs, or rotate the tires. After my music lessons, he would watch me cut the lawn. Off to the side, he might trim the bushes, weave the tree lawn's curb, or repair a loose step on the porch. He assigned me minor tasks to help him. As I cut the grass moving back and forth in long rows, he checked my work, looking carefully for spots I had missed. He quickly noticed how clumsy I was with tools and how sloppily I pushed the lawn mower along overlapping rows of grass. Sometime in midsummer, I noticed him looking directly into my face as I worked. In the past, he had warned me about my ability to become so easily distracted my inability to concentrate. At that moment, I thought that he was about to warn me again. Instead, he looked at me casually and inquired whether I knew there was a world beyond the books in my room and the library on 140th and Kinsman. Before I could answer, he remarked that in 1915, he had been born in Cincinnati to a ditch digger and somewhat improbably, it seemed to me, his educated stay-at-home wife. My father had lived briefly in Cincinnati and later in Winchester, Kentucky during the 20s and 30s. At the height of the Depression in the 30s, his father, Lucian, could not always feed his wife and eight children. On payday, when the eagle flew, as he might say, Lucian might bring home a steak. On the other weekdays, the children would make do with bread and jam or mayonnaise with a glass of water. For a little while in the mid-thirties, four or five of the brothers shared a large mattress with a cat. Romping on the bed one morning after awakening, the brothers discovered the cat's incomprehensibly stiff body. The cat was dead. Everything that lives dies, my father observed. Did I know that I would die? Death was something with which his schoolmates had been acquainted. During the typhoid epidemic of 1923, in the wake of warnings about the town's water, the disease had struck Winchester, killing many of the black children his age. When their temperatures passed 102 degrees, he said, the children usually died. Their stiff bodies wrapped in white were lifted into ambulances and never seen again. His mother, my grandmother Julia, told eight-year-old Clarence Richards that we do not come here to stay, and his little friends were no more. Years later, his father, Lucian, died in bed, howling with pain, his stomach perforated with ulcers. Downstairs, his wife and children listened helplessly. This might have been predicted. Like me, my father observed dryly, Lucian was always gobbling his food. Part of it. And I have a real, um, I have a real short piece 
here. And I think, how much time do I have? Like 10 minutes? Yeah, about 10. About 10. Um, at some point, well, no, I'll read um, the, um, whatever radical, this is from Yale, whatever radical, um, it was first published in Commentary and then Journal of Blacks of Higher Education, whatever medical sympath uh, radical sympathies I brought to Yale were destroyed by the 1970 May Day protest um, during Huey Newton's trial in um, um, New Haven. It should be Bobby Seals. Bobby Seals trial in New Haven. I had entered Yale with a cynical view of privileged white radical students as well as contempt for the black middle class. This attitude not only contributed to endless confusion but ultimately made me a deeply alienated loner. My growing sense of estrangement came to a head during the apocalyptic protest at Yale during the time of the Cambodian invasion. All the derangements of the drug culture, the free-floating paranoia of the new left, and the R&B fantasies of the nascent black power movement coalesced during a week whose neurotic tone simply amplified the dominant tenor of Yale life. Indeed, for all the supposed political significance of the time, what I remember most was its ethos of manic depression, a roller coaster of highs and lows, at one meeting of students and faculty in the hockey arena, I saw the eminent psychologist Kenneth Keniston rise from the crowd to introduce himself as a psychologist and lead a demented speaker off the podium. Watching this bizarre spectacle, I felt a certain amount of ironic detachment at seeing the author of The Uncommitted confront the public manifestation of his academic specialty. As a senior in high school, I had read and admired Keniston's subtle case study of Enburn, although as an 18-year-old, I could not grasp the book's import in, in completely, it did alert me to the fact that the casual postures of alienation assumed with so much effort in Cleveland Heights might not in and of themselves be a good thing. The study of Enburn, whom Keniston in a typically literary gesture compares to Ishmael, reminded me of a much more raffish good friend of mine who would never gain the attention of Keniston's Harvard students. However, he on the stage on that spring night was deep alienation, and Keniston was approaching the podium with all the distaste of a professor asked to apply one of his more abstract theories to a real-life problem. My sense of detachment deepened as I watched him look around the audience in search, I now surmise, of the photographer from the New York Times. The depressing self-importance of one's elders could surpass the ubiquitous mania of the Yale students. As I walked with a large crowd to the hockey arena that night, I had heard a young student, casually correct in thick channel pants, blue button-down Oxford, and a beige London fog jacket, recite Yeats's September 1919. I didn't recognize him as an English major, but he looked very literary, rather like the tall, disdainful prep student who had announced outside my advisor's office that he would not take Harold Bloom's seminar because he so disliked the riffraff that gathered around these great men. Um, um, the Oxford-clad student spoke the words of the poem loudly and a trifle too quickly with the intentionally unpremeditated earnestness that plays such a large part of Yaley charm. As his lockjaw accent floated over the crowd, moving in the evening darkness down the hill to the rink, one could almost forgive him for imposing upon a crowd of 300 in order to impress the hearty looking blonde girl beside him. It has taken me 20 years to realize that that student's arrogant exhilaration altogether a match for Keniston's somber self-importance was what that night was really about. To thrive in chaos, to impose the order of the self upon the disorder of change was the great lesson of Yale in the late 60s and early 70s. And to my hardened sensibility, the order of the self meant the arrogant privilege of the most self-dramatizing of my classmates. As my professors strained to show how 
Pope and Milton drew upon the antinomies of Concordia discourse to dramatize the order within the divinely created plenitude celebrated in poems like Windsor Forest and Paradise Lost, so were my classmates forever imposing the demands of their imperial egos upon the vast resources represented by Yale's intellectual, cultural, and material magnificence, which may have been the closest thing to the sacred that they knew. Indeed, one quickly came to feel that the scholarly concerns inside the classroom and the uncontrollable appetites for a diverse experience without were part of the autumnal ripeness of late 60s prosperity and the imperial order that sustained their wealth. The drive to take it all in may well have been a farewell gesture to financial reserves that would rapidly disappear as gas prices rose and, st rose and stagflation emerged. Certainly, no English major at Yale could fail to connect the perpetual suburban version of the tempest being performed on campus and the megalomania that emerged when the Black Panthers came to New Haven for the trial, when rumors of the impending apocalyptic destruction of Yale um, spread throughout those parochial academic communities of the East Coast. I don't know if anybody here was on the East Coast in uh, 70, but there were rumors that Yale would burn um, in the trial. Um, King and Brewster shut down the university and um, everybody just came. Um, um, a sense of apocalypse was very much in the air, as one might expect of a student community anticipating the arrival of the Black Panthers while swaying to the beat of the doors. Much was the, made of the way in which the Yale community pulled together to save itself that weekend from impending disaster. The school had shut down its facilities and a crowd gathered for demonstrations in disgust and fear. I abandoned New Haven. Much has been made of the hardships of portable toilets and the granola eaten by all after the dining room closed. That week I rode down to LaGuardia and took a plane to Cleveland. As I was walking to the hotel limousine in New Haven on my way to LaGuardia in the Midwest, I saw the family of a classmate. Apparently his younger brother had just arrived from the family's uptown co-op on Park Avenue for the adventure. The mother, still slender in her 40s, was dressed in a linen summer suit. She stepped out of the new Volvo station wagon to kiss her younger son, dramatically putting both hands around his face. A publicly conspicuous display of concern, clearly intended as a political statement. I was not moved. Indeed, I was totally disgusted. And the stuffed briefcase I carried with materials for papers on Stevens and Elliott was my answer to the upper class Babylon in the dorms that I began, was beginning to despise as well as to the gentrified Armageddon at hand. This revulsion welled throughout the upper part of my body and I would not recognize its source until years later when Nancy Helmbold, my Latin teacher at the University of Chicago, asked me to translate the words, although they were appearing in another context, Carthago Delenda asked, um, Carthage ought to be destroyed. When I returned to Yale after a weekend in Cleveland, however, I found not John of the Apocalypse, but quite predictably Rabelais. Upon my return, I was met by a close friend who informed me that in the heat of a spring night, a couple had copulated nude on one of the green billiard tables in the basement of Branford College. Whether or not it happened was, of course, beside the point. The luridness of the rumor itself being the logical fulfillment of the erotic exhibitionism that was never far from the center of leftist politics. Indeed, even the friend who reported this to me, a smart, witty, gay student of comparative literature, seemed a little taken aback. There was an unsettling hint of derangement in the idea underlying the tale itself. Even if the event had transpired as alleged, public intercourse was not the kind of behavior one traditionally expected from upper class heterosexuals. Um, the image of a world the image of a world turned upside down would predominate my memories of the week that followed. 
the most vivid of which was the sight of feces smeared on a piece of paper on one of the bulletin boards of the college post office, uh, Yale Station. Understandably, perhaps, this crude allusion to the fashionable doctrine that the medium is the message pro <coughs> uh, provoked no excitement. Standing in a nearby corner, I watched out of curiosity as student after student passed it without even turning to find the source of the smell. Okay.